Um, so as Tiffany said, right, we're going to do today is kind of go through purview. We're just going to presume first that you may not actually understand what purview is. So what we're going to do is this kind of level set um, purview. And then what we'll do is we will look at the architecture behind it and be able to go um, through that information. So I'm going to share my screen here and we quickly go through. So going through this, um, also joining me today is Hawk Fan from our uh, what we call our cross purview team. Our role is to work with um, partners such as yourselves to under make sure that a people understand, you know, how to position purview, how to implement and operationalize purview so that our customers actually right drive value and adopt from the purview perspective. Oh, just quickly to kind of set the stage for us today, what we're looking at, we're going to look at some of the, just kind of set the stage again, data governance challenges. I know you guys live this day in and day out, but just so you can understand our view of this, what was our vision for Purview, kind of where we are. And then um, also then we'll look at the data map and the catalog applications, which are going to be coming GA here in the immediate future. So again, right? Data governance is becoming, or not is becoming, is is interdisciplinary, right? And so we have chief data officers that are trying to understand what data does the organization have, where did the data come from, is it trustable, right? What's my exposure? Um, am I being compliant? Lots of different questions. We want to go through those pieces, and then on the front side of that, you've got data management, data stewards, and business owners that are trying to understand. Uh, you know, how we're managing our data, what data, again, the data, what questions we have, how am I using it, data science and data analyst, but then are we being compliant, right? Are we managing our access controls? Do we have the appropriate security and privacy um, checks in place? So, you know, taking this account and or these into consideration, we look at this and we say, okay, right, there's a data governance operating model. I'm sure every one of you has one of these lying around somewhere. But we want to kind of go through these just real quickly, right? There's people, processes, policies, and technology, right? And understanding how we create, protect, store, use, maintain, archive, and eventually destroy or archive information away. And then we understand, you know, where are each of our customers in their journey from completely ungoverned to fully governed, right? And very, very few people are on the fully governed side. But we want to go through is how do you start to build out those things, right? So you need to understand your people, understand the policies that you're looking to, to drive, and that will drive the technology, right? So that's kind of the big piece of this. And so we took, um, although Microsoft is developing, you know, a, a past solution, we look at this and how do we support the people and the policies and the processes? How does our technology enable and support those versus just how do we build a technology? Um, I won't bore a lot of time on this one, but managing the growing data landscape, right? So people have on-premises, they have Azure, they have multiple clouds, they have SaaS services. And so how do I actually start to understand and comprehend the data I have across this? Um, I have operational silos, so I have different business units, I have IT, I have data stewards. Um, people want to be able to use the data as fast as I possibly can, but I want to make sure, again, back to those data, those CDO type questions, right? Am I using the right data? It, can I trust this information? Am I using it, you know, with inside the guidelines? I've been told I can use it. And then at the end, how well am I complying with industry regulations to make sure that, you know, I'm not in violation? So with all that kind of set up, Again, we looked at this and said, okay, great, right? There are lots of tools. There are lots of tools out in the marketplace. We want to be able to go through and understand what's happening, right? So we want to look at this and how, how can we reimagine this for cloud scale? How do we lay out the foundation, right, for effective data governance? Because we see that there are multiple pillars, right, and disciplines in the data governance, you know, broader arena. And then how can we make this more self-service, right, for our consumers and our business users and reduce the burden, right, from our IT organizations and technology organizations on how we actually manage this. So Purview comes through with this, and the first piece of this is our data map, right? So our data map is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to automate, automatically connect to and update 
you know, data sources, whether they be operational databases like Azure SQL, you know, ADLS Gen 2, analytics and AI systems like, um, you know, Synapse, Power BI, et cetera, on-premises systems, because we realize there is a world beyond Microsoft, right? So Oracle, Ter Teradata, AWS, um, GCP, you know, SAP, just to name a few of the, the pieces on the outside. And we look at this and we said, okay, we're gonna build a data map again Part of this is being able to automate that metadata and lineage capture. So we reduce the need for IT to interact with and manage. Um, in addition to that, we wanna start adding business context to this information. So that's the classification and business context. So we are able to classify information, social security numbers, first names, last names, emails, um, they're out of the box classifiers. And then you also have the ability to build specific classifiers that are unique um, to your customer's data um, estate. Then on top of that, right, we wanna build the insights and enforcement kind of going back to that conversation. Am I using the data? How do I know how the data is being used? And am I you know, enforcing this information properly? And then we built all of this on top of an open API. So we are Apache Atlas you know, is what we're built on top of. We did that for a myriad of reasons, one, it's so it's, you know, it you can find resources in the open marketplace to do this, but two, you understand how to exchange information with Purview very simply, right? So you can update, you can add elements to Purview via the API, you can update or enhance elements that are inside Purview um, with the API, or you can, you know, export information, um, you know, to supplement other types of information and reporting. So if we look at this, we kind of say, okay, great. We got the data map. We've got the classifications. What are kind of the experiences, right, that we want to be able to do around this? And the first of these is the data catalog. So that's the human manifestation, right, of the data map and the human interaction with the data map. Um, so that's an experience that can be done either via a UI or via the API, right? But the, the experience there allows us to understand quickly find information, quickly search for data, and identify the information I'm looking for or how well this data is you know, in place. In addition to that, the other pillars we're looking at are data sharing, which we'll talk a little bit about. Data quality, you know, how well does this data fit my purpose? Uh, master data management, so reference data management, you know, where are my golden copies? How well is this information maintained? Where am I looking for different information around? Data use governance, and this one for us is really around data access protection is the main portion of that. So now that I know where my data is and I know what my data is, who should have access to it? And then data privacy. So again, and we look at all of these, right? So the one big thing with this is that they're all built on top of a single experience, right? A single foundation um, in the open marketplace, right? And I know we're talking to partners, but in the open marketplace, you have to stitch together disparate um, tools and technologies to try to do this for a customer where we at Microsoft are building that foundation, making it you know, easier for you to implement and manage and easier to extend this for, for customers um, going forward and being able to provide better value across those, those systems and platforms. So kind of where are we in our journey? Right, so where we are right now is the data map and the data catalog, as I said um, a few moments ago, is going to go GA imminently. Um, so there are there is an event next week that hopefully you have signed up for, where there will be major announcements around the purview system. Um, in addition to that, where we are from a data sharing perspective is that is available today in a GA, but in a standalone situation. And so we will be moving forward, and this is public knowledge, right? So we'll be moving forward in Q4 with bringing that data share um, information inside the um, Purview and Synapse experiences. In addition to that, we'll also be in Q4 starting the base of the data quality. So we'll start being able to do that. We're focusing first inside the Azure stack. And then as we you know, build out those base capabilities, we'll extend that um, beyond the Azure um, environment into other Microsoft and other um, on-premises or cross-cloud systems. I'm gonna jump master data management and we'll come back to that in a moment. Also in Q4, 
um, we're going to release our um, our first portions of the data use governance policies. And there's going to be two, two sides of basically the same coin. The first one's going to be direct asset um, policy management. Um, so again, inside the Azure stack, so Azure Storage, ADLS Gen 2, and Azure Blob, and Azure SQL, you'll be able to write policies against a specific system. So server one, database A, you know, table one, um, give group X access to it. On the flip of that, which also go to public preview in Q4, is the self-service access. So if I'm searching through Purview and I find a, an Azure SQL data system or data set that I'm interested in, so that server one, database A, table one, I can request access and there'll be workflow management inside a Purview that will allow owner or owners to say yes, that Carrie can have access to this or no, Carrie can't. If the answer is yes, Carrie can, then Purview will also manage the update and management of the policies on the, the Azure storage and the Azure SQL systems to now give access to me. Um, and there'll be more coming, right? But these are under, those portions are under NDA. They'll be coming more in Q1. We're expanding that logic. And then also for data privacy, we will be bringing out the MVP for our data consent or data consent management. So again, right, we make sure that we're capturing and managing consent and we'll also bring out the MVP for data subject rights um, management as well. So making sure that we're managing that data in conjunction with the, the, the consent from that customer, as well as the security rights for some of the major policies that are out there. Um, beyond those, there is again, ex there are, we're investing heavily and in extending these beyond, um, and we can have individual conversations, but those will be under NDA, um, you know, with more details around that piece. Again, we saw from the last slide, right? Again, the data map, data assets, what we mean by asset is a table, a folder, a container. Um, we have the lineage you know, from inside that system, as well as that we can, you know, extend that lineage utilizing Azure Data Factory and Synapse um, and Power BI, as well as we can also extend that lineage, again, via the API with other tools that you may have or your customers, customers may have on premises, the classifications, and again, the business glossaries, right? So we can attach that business context um, to that information. Again, our focus out of the, the gate for the data map and catalog will include both on-premises, multi-cloud and SaaS functions. And the initial focus will be on operational, analytical and reporting type data sources. So again, this is the roadmap at the public um, perspective of that, right? Currently where we are, we're in public preview for the data map, the catalog, the insights, and the insights are the reporting. Um, and how these things are being used. And also through partners, we have a ability to, to divide or provide MDM, so the master data management, that is a partner first strategy, where rest of pillars are a um, you know, development first or extension first type function. So in Q3, right, and this is Q3 calendar year, so yes, we are rapidly approaching the end of Q3. We're gonna go GA with our data map and our data catalog. Um, the data insights will stay in public preview. So the reporting and you know the use of this information will stay in public preview. It will be there, but we're continuing to e expand that um, information uh, around and providing more um, functionality to that. Also in Q3, we've now released our pre private preview for data policies. And then in Q4, um, again, in conjunction with the data map and the catalog, we're also going to move the insights to GA and we will public preview the policy functions as well as then we'll uh, instantiate a private preview for data quality and for the data sharing with inside the purview um, experience. Then just kind of give you guys some idea of where our innovations or our investment themes are, are going. It's gonna be around data privacy, no, no surprise. Um, extending and expanding the data quality. Um, also extending and expanding the policies so to provide it you know, more power around data access and loss prevention, um, continuing to increase our connections and our ability to ingest not only the assets, but the lineage um, from multi-cloud sources, 
and then also making it easier and more um, workflow manageable for the curation and steward of the metadata inside the purview system. So I'm going to go briefly into kind of each of the different pillars, and then we will look at kind of the architecture behind Purview, you know, connecting to these different types of sources. Again, so we talk about these, right? So the map of the data assets. So you have the ability into a v, via a UI to view the different sources that are connected to Purview, as well as the metadata and schema and lineage associated to those information, as well as we have a set of out of the box connectors that we're constantly expanding. Um, and again, you also can connect to systems via the API that are not supported as part of the out of the box connectors in purview for the moment. But you can extend that piece again, automated data discovery, classification and lineage. And then we also have the ability to extend the lineage or um, you know, incorporate the lineage across functions through Azure Data Factory and Synapse and Power BI. And then we also have, you know, we're working on entity definitions for industry models. So those will be coming um, in the next, you know, in the next quarters. So you can actually look at the different types of data models and make sure that you have business glossary terms associated to those models that you can incorporate and import into the purview system. And then we also have the, the you know, a single, again, a single experience for our applications. And then also the, you know, just as important to this is the extensible model where you can extend, you know, metadata beyond the information that we have. So today, if you want to incorporate something from Azure SQL that is not in our base type definition, you have to create a new type definition. But again, public knowledge in Q4, we'll be extending that where you no longer have to create a custom type def you'll be able to create custom attributes. And I know if you haven't touched Purview, these are a little distinction, but basically there is a attribute template, all right, for the metadata that we're capturing around Azure SQL. And today you have to create a new template if you want to add custom attributes to that. And in Q4, you'll be able to just extend the, the templates that we've developed for the custom attributes that are needed in your customer's environment. So again, making it more extensible, but again, simplifying the amount of effort and um, confusion in being able to do that extension. So I'll spend a little bit of time here, right? And so we can go through these pieces, what we're looking at. Again, I won't drain this. These You'll have access to this information, but some of the biggest differentiators we have, right, is ability to do the data scanning classification from a central system for the on-premises, the multi-cloud, and the SaaS-based services. Again, we have over 22 points of presence currently in 12 geographies, and we're continuing to expand and roll this out to the um, both the Azure um, data centers, but as well as the AWS and Google data centers as well. Again, a big thing here is the data classification and labeling. So these classifications are the Microsoft standard classifications. They've just been brought into Purview, as well as if you have customers that are utilizing MIP, which you're going to see a demo in just a little while from and hear more information um, later in the session, you can also connect MIP to Purview. And so you can bring those sensitivity and security labels into the information as well as the classification of the data. And again, we talked about this, right? You, we have the automated um, lineage extraction from Azure Data Factory, um, Data Share, Power BI, and Synapse. But we also have extended this now to be able to bring in store procedures and views inside um, Azure SQL, as well as we're extending this to Power BI. Um, so sub artifacts, so data sets, tables, columns, and measures will come in Q4. And you also have the ability to extend this lineage right via the API um, for things that if you're utilizing um, systems like Azure Databricks or other types of ETL um, pipelines, you can push that lineage into Purview via the API as well. Again, all this is via the portal, but you're also able to programmatically and operationalize this via the APIs and our software development kits. So anything you can do via the, the, the UI or the user experience, the portal, you can also do via the APIs for scale and automation.
Oops, I'll we'll back up real quick. So this one actually does show you the lineage. I know it's very difficult to see, um, but so this is the lineage from inside the system. So we start from where the lineage is. Again, this has now been extended utilizing Synapse and um, Azure Data Factory. We can see the copy commands, what was copied, where the information went to. It went to a Power BI workspace. And from that workspace, you know, again, what, what reports is it now being transitioned onto? Um, one thing you can actually also do is you can shift this into a column view. So I can actually look at a column from the sales fact table and see exactly which of those processes it's impacted in. So I know if I change a column, I know my downstream impacts um, based on that column. So I just want to back up and touch on that real quick. So from the data catalog, right, we talked about this. The data catalog is the human you know, manifestation um, in, the, in the purview studio allows us to do this. We can search. We can search on business terms. We can search for technical terms. We can search by owners. We can search by types of data sources it's sending. We can search by, you know, the glossary terms. So it allows us to very quickly, and you'll see this in the demo, right? We very quickly go from a large set of information to a small set of information to find the data I'm looking for. Um, and then again, we talked about the visualization, which we saw a moment ago. In addition to that, we are introducing NQ4 um, workflows and also we'll be introducing business rules. So business rules will allow um, your customers right, to define specific uh, classifications or terminologies based on multiple criteria. So that will actually allow you to start you know, applying glossary terms at automation versus having to do it manually. Data insights, right? So we talked about this one. This is going to stay in public preview, but we'll go GA um, by the end of the year. This gives you a bird's eye view of what your data estate is. is. Um, so it tells me, you know, where are most of my data assets? So this gives you a graphical view of, you know, where my data assets are. Are they in, you know, Azure files? Are they in blob storage? Are they in AWS S3? Are they in SQL databases? Are they in Teradata, et cetera? So you get to be able to see that very quickly. Um, again, you can also go through your glossary terms to understand how many assets are associated to a glossary term. If you have glossary terms that are not being used, right? So that again, kind of helps you in your maintenance and management of your data processes, your, your data governance processes. And then also the data classification and labeling. So you'll be able to see um, the classification of data, how many assets are classified, on which specific classifications are the most. And then also from sensitivity label, you can also do that. And then again, filter directly from the insights back to the individual assets themselves. And coming um, in Q4 or early Q1, we'll be able to also be able to see if you're moving data, um, where that data is moving to and from, and especially specifically across geographic movement. So you can see if you're moving data from, you know, data center A to data center B, that may actually cross geopolitical boundaries. And therefore, you, you know, make sure that you're aware of that to help with the, um, you know, compliance until the, the data privacy and assessment capabilities fully come online. These are just a couple of different types of insights we talked about, right? The label insights, and those are hard to see. The other thing I want to touch on here before we get into the actual um, demos is that what we're working on here is to, obviously we want to make sure that we can support platforms outside the Microsoft's ecosystem, but inside the Microsoft ecosystem and the Azure ecosystem, we want to make sure that we provide no cliff user experiences, right? So we want to be able to make sure that the work that we've done um, in you know, Purview can be utilized in Power BI and Synapse directly, as well as the work that then is done in Power BI and Synapse can be you know, managed and viewed from Purview and also be able to access those informations directly from Purview. Um, those experiences. So we can look at this and I can say I've done my we've done our cataloging, we've done our classifications, we've done that information inside um, Synapse. I can directly search for that information. Once I find that information, so I've found I'm looking for sales information. Once I found those different result sets, I can then decide um, directly inside Synapse how I want to consume that, right? Do I want to create a new script? Do I want to create a new notebook? 
Um, do I want to create a new data flow, right, to manipulate and transform that information? So again, we're working on this whole piece to be better together, as well as in understanding that there is a, you know, a ecosystem and a world outside of Microsoft that we also extend our support into those functions, but make sure that, you know, we have the best user experiences that we can possibly deliver when we're crossing our own types of platforms. Um, I'll drop from sharing here real quick, and then we can see if there were questions or do we want to hold those to the end um, on being able to, if Hawk was able to answer those. If not, then we can go ahead and go into a demonstration of the Purview platform. We'll walk through the functionality that is going to be coming um, in the, the GA that's coming in the M in the future. All right. So Hawk, to you. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Gary. Um, please remember that Purview is in preview, so please do not share this information. Carrie, that was a great session. Um, before we move to the next presentation, please feel free, everybody, to post your questions in the chat window. Um, we're seeing a lot of questions coming in and we're getting some great feedback. Um, so we love the enthusiasm, so please keep those questions coming. And as Carrie mentioned, next up we have Hawk Pham. Hawk is a senior program manager, um, and he's going to take us through a demo on how to set up and use Azure Purview and the connectors. So with that, I'll hand the baton to Hawk. Thanks, Hawk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Hawk Pham, and um, today I'm going to go over a, a quick demo of Purview. Uh, basically, I will start with a um, uh, you know a quick overview of what the end user are going to see. Um, basically, the end user here that we're talking about, basically the uh, the custom, you know, the the customer purview, the the business user, uh, how they come can come in purview, uh, browse and search, and um, look at access detail and figure out what they want to do. Um, <clears throat> and then I can show um, a, another scenario, actually, uh, basically how an organization can onboard purview. Uh, you know, they're gonna start creating the account. Uh, it's gonna be blank in the beginning. And what exactly the process to setting up the collections and um, you know set up one scan. I'm gonna do one example of scanning one storage account um, and walk you through a uh, example of some glossary and classification. And um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna trigger a scan. Uh, of course, we're not gonna wait for the scan to finish, but I can show you the end outcome of that. Um, so that's the second scenario. Um, the third scenario I'm going to show is basically our messaging around the Power BI and Synapse uh, integration, uh, which is basically this piece over here. Uh, we can walk you through a scenario of how the end user uh, use Synapse and search for an access in uh, Purview, get the information, and run a quick query. And if we have time, we can you know jump to the the inside piece. Uh, basically, it's not in GA yet. Um, will be sometime next year. And we can look around some scenario, um, basically uh, how a data, uh, how the security officer uh, look at the environments, figure out what's missing and whatnot, and um, you know do some exploration and audit. Okay, so that basically the agenda. So what you see here right now is um, is what we have um, uh, in our demo environment um, with the artificial company called Adatum Corp. Uh, we did a bunch of scan already, um, but I'm going to run to one scenario of setting up uh, some uh, blob storage scanning. <clears throat> so uh, before an organization can start by onboarding Purview, uh, what they need to figure out or work on is uh, is the logical definitions of how the data um, can be grouping together. <clears throat> uh, of course, you know, you don't want to commingle uh, data from various department or location into the same place. So a way to do this is actually to break it out by using collection. And collection is a, you know, is a logical concept that we define within Purview. And we start with a root collection here, uh, as you can see. And you can define the collection using, um, you know, very criteria. It could be based on the data center location. It could be based on the department, the HR, you know, marketing. Uh, here we actually use a very simplistic uh, example of a location, um, Americas, and then uh, you let's say you have a multi-cloud user, then you have an Amazon, Azure, and Google, uh, as well as the on-prem uh, data center. So 
<clears throat> we're going to use this as one example and we're going to set up uh, a scan uh, and locate that within the Azure and um, BI North America. OK, um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a quick example of how to create a collection, actually, because you know, collection is a way we uh, set the authorization uh, for access. So each of the user uh, have the raw assignment in the collection. We only have access to that particular collection, collection and the children of it. So adding a collection is super simple. Um, you have to be an admin, uh, the collection admin, and give it a name um, and description, and you know you can go ahead and create a uh, collection. So let's say you know we do an Asia um, uh, data center here, um, and it's going to be a quick one. It's going to pop up a collection here, and you can continue to go on creating another choice, you know, and and then keep going. Um, so that's the first step to, uh, for onboarding. Uh, the second step is basically to set up the, the sources. So um, this is basically uh, a leverage our engine of scanning. Um, you know, with other technology, you you kind of still have to go out and figure out where the data are. But we do have an automated way to set up the scanner so that it can reach out to the sources uh, using a authentication method that you define. Uh, and we have a lot of various uh, connector uh, over here uh, out of the box. <clears throat> so a lot of them are actual, including uh, yeah, you know, other technology as well, uh, like Google, you can see here. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, we do have Amazon support as well, uh, right here. Um, <clears throat> and also some uh, on-prem support, like uh, High Meta Store. Uh, let's say if you want to scan uh, existing Hadoop cluster, you can leverage the High Meta Store to do the scan. So let me walk you through one example of how to set up a, um, a scanning on the storage account. So I do have a storage account here. Let me click continue. <clears throat> uh, so I have a storage account called Demo Catalog ADC Blocks. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very basic one. Um, what we need to define first is basically the access control. So in order for Purview to scan anything, uh, you need to tell Purview that, hey, uh, the Purview manager identity, you, you will have permission to access this particular resources uh, to do a read on it. Um, <clears throat> so the way to do that is to do the raw assignment in the control plane of the resources. And it's actually, you know, the same concept applicable to other resources as well. Uh, and, and we can go to the, you know, you can uh, go to the documentation and and uh, and figure out what particular um, uh, permission that require for that that resource. So in this case, you know, I have the uh, HO PHAN the Dashboard V1 uh, as an application to have the storage uh, plot data reader on this uh, particular resource. Um, <clears throat> so that would give us the permission uh, to scan uh, that uh, drop account. So let me call this. It's the same name as this. Uh, let me set up it really quick. So this is under our partner lab. <clears throat> uh, partner sandbox, demo, there we go. Uh, and click register. So the two steps in you know setting up the scan in general. So you have to register it and you um, actually I forgot to uh, put it into the uh, correct um, correct um, uh, collection. So actually you could delete the um, uh, data sources from here. Let's say you put it into the wrong root collection. Let me go ahead and delete it. I will recreate it. OK, uh, here. Continue. And select the partner again. Demo. So I mentioned earlier we want to put that under the Azure and BI North America. So let's go ahead and do that and click register again and let's fall it under here. <clears throat> so the two step uh, again, uh, you need to set up the uh, the data sources basically to declare that here is the FQN that we want to go after and use um, uh, and um, and it's a basically, you know, this has a type. This is a blob story type and the second step is to set up the scan. So you see the little uh, radar icon here. Uh, this will give you a well, it will walk you through a journey of how to set up a scan. Basically, just follow five screen um, and the name of it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> usually we just say, you know, something like the initial can, initial scan and just go from there. Now, uh, remember I mentioned earlier about the authority um, authentication method. 
Um, we recommend to use the Purview uh, MSI credential, which is basically your account name, you know, right here, the um, uh, HOPHAN dash Purview one, um, which we already added in the um, uh, blob, uh, storage blob data reader, right? <clears throat> so once that's done, give it a few minutes and do a test connection, and this will be successful here, and you can continue to move on with uh, the scan configuration. So uh, there's several things you have to consider. Um, our recommendation is when you start the scan, you know, uh, for the first time, uh, go ahead and set up the full scan on everything. Uh, basically, you tell Purview to, uh, you know, to scan the entire um, uh, data lake uh, at the top level uh, and reach out to everything underneath that. That would set up the foundation or, you know, establish all the entities uh, within Purview at once. Uh, and then after this, you can set up, let's say, you know, weekly or bi-weekly or even monthly um, recurring um, based on a schedule uh, to do incremental scan. Um, so the incremental scan only detect the difference and uh, it actually saves you a lot of costs uh, in terms of like, you know, the, 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 the vehicle hours. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you don't have to do a full scan again. Uh, you do the first full scan initially and that was, you know, establish the folders and the resource set the structure uh, after this. So let, let, let's go ahead and select all here and click continue. Um, the next thing you need to consider is basically what we call a scan rule set. Um, so you can click on the system default and view the detail, uh, but you could customize this, right? So let me go ahead and customize one. Um, <clears throat> so you can create a scan rule set called, let's say, test one, and uh, just give it a name, and it walks you through a um, uh, um, list of uh, schema extraction and you know basically a file type for and classification. So uh, whatever we have here are the default out of the box that we support. Um, so a lot of people asking for like, hey, can we scan uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, PDF, uh, you know, uh, yes, we can. Uh, we can scan those and get the classification in there. So let's say somebody have an Excel spreadsheet with uh, social security number or like credit card in there, we can detect that, we can flag that. <coughs> uh, and we can also look into the uh, zip file um, and, and, um, and do classification in there. Um, so let's say, you know, we're going to do everything here. Um, the next step to consider is basically your classification. So classification, we have a very basic way to do classification just, um, uh, just based on regex, uh, and the reason is for performance. So we run, we do a sampling of the data um, <coughs> about the first field of rows um, or a subset of um, uh, a parquet uh, the table. And uh, we read the sample and we determine whether or not uh, a column uh, or the entire table is basically fit in particular classification. So a uh, PAI is something people ask a lot, like, you know, do I have, um, you know, email address or like, uh, you know, birthday and a name of the person in the, this particular data set? Um, <clears throat> so we, we, you know, we detect this kind of thing. Uh, if there's something that looks like an email address, then we will flag that. And if it's matched, you know, basically if it matches a particular regex uh, formula, uh, then we'll flag that. Uh, in addition, you could also have uh, a way to define your custom classification. And we're not going to go through the detail of how to do this here, but uh, you could define the custom custom classification based on several things, you know, um, the actual data itself, like what the patterns look like. Uh, the name of the columns, uh, stuff like that, and you know um, uh, how how many times it, uh, it happened, the, the frequencies. Uh, um, so there's a menu options that you can define that uh, in the separate screen. So at this point, let's go ahead and click, you know, create and finalize on the uh, scan rule set, and we click continue. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, initially you want to do a full scan, but in the future, um, you know, you want to do a recurring scan, maybe, you know, uh, you know, uh, the end of Friday um, to do a scan over the weekend and Monday morning people coming into work and it's all done, right? <clears throat> so that will be one example. Um, so go ahead and click uh, one share and we, you know, click continue, uh, review your summary of the scan and click save and run, right? Um, so that would be an, an example of how to set up the scan uh, in your environment. Um, again, you know, each department will have their own collection. If you defy it that way, then they will have their own collection admin to go through uh, and set up the scan for their department or their location or, you know, whatever they want to defy. Um, <clears throat> so we're not going to sit around and wait for the scan to finish. I'm just going to jump to a different screen when everything is done. 
Um, so again, do see the overview of everything that uh, been scanned in this environment. <clears throat> Let's walk through two examples. Um, uh, a circ and a brown experience. So uh, as an end user, and you know, if I'm a business user and working uh, uh, in the um, uh, ML analyst and I want to do some data analysis, uh, what I want to do is to find, uh, let's say, you know, customer uh, um, table so I can do some analysis on it. <clears throat> and this, you know, this gives you a search. Um, it, this provides a search experience, so you can search for anything here. Uh, typing in a keyword, you know, you can use uh, asterisk at the end um, to customize your search experience, <clears throat> and you can do filtering. So. Um, uh, and you can do a technical uh, filtering with the data source name. Like, you know, if people know where the data come from, they can basically select, uh, you know, various sources over here. Uh, if they know the uh, collection they belong to, let's say it's, uh, you know, the customer table here basically belong to, I believe it's here, uh, North America, no? Yeah. Uh, then you can uh, narrow it out to your specific collection or classification. Let's say uh, if the customer table contains some email address, right? Um, um, you know, that would be, you know, the two way to use it, right? I mean, uh, you want to look for, let's say you do have access to customer table with email address, then you can shuffle it. Or the other way to look at this is, let's say you want to do audits, uh, whatever uh, table that has customer email address, you want to find out what they are and figure out if they're supposed to be like this, right? <clears throat> um, there are other ways to filter as well, like the contact information. Uh, the label, so this is an integration that Kerry mentioned earlier on the uh, MIP. Um, uh, we can uh, scan and leverage the existing um, <coughs> uh, AIP engine to uh, get the labeling information. So this is the confidential, um, you know, you can select on this and find out what uh, assets have the confidential information uh, in here. <coughs> and finally, um, you can do the uh, filter by the class return. So it's a lot of, you know, business users don't really care about like, you know, a long name like this. Uh, they only care about the actual, you know, business term that related to what they do. So, you know, let's say sale order, then um, they only want to select particular assets belong to that particular, uh, you know, business term that uh, they define. <coughs> um, so that's one, you know, one experience to go about this. The second experience I want to show you as a business user is the ability to browse. So start with the browse asset button here. Uh, you can browse by the collection or you can browse by the asset, the source type. Um, so one use case here that we show a lot to people is uh, the Power BI integration. So Power BI, we can scan them. We scan the entire tenant and we group by the workspaces. <coughs> um, and you can browse starting by the workspace and go down to a particular report. So in this case, let me jump to one Power BI report. So the question here is, you know, I know the the workspace and the report name, but I have no idea how it's coming, you know, like where the data coming from, uh, how people created it, like, uh, okay, you know, what the data source look like, yeah, where is it in the lake, for example, right? Um, so this give you a, a screen of uh, the Power BI report, uh, including all the metadata of it um, <coughs> uh, um, and the qualifying name here. Um, if you do have class three tag on the particular particular assets, then they will show up here. Um, actually, let's do that really quick. Uh, let's see. Let's say you, we want to tag this with a sale uh, uh, order, uh, right? So we can do that. We can uh, do the class three time add and click save, and that will be saved in the assets itself. <clears throat> now back to the original question. You know, where is it coming from? Uh, that would be the power of the lineage. So when we scan Power BI, we actually get the lineage information from within Power BI and link that with the entire lake or the other resources or assets that we have uh, within Power BI. So it's, you know, it's exploding outside of Power BI. Uh, if people use Power BI before, uh, you know you can get the lineage wheel within Power BI, right? But that's only limited to what we see in Power BI. Um, so in Power BI, you can see this similar example here of a, um, <coughs> a data flow, um, uh, the <coughs> a data flow coming in, and um, you know, and maybe you do some data massaging with uh, just some CSV file, 
and uh, a table here, right? <clears throat> and you create a data set. And from that data set, you create a report, right? Uh, so this is a view that you typically could get within Power BI, but what you don't have is like, okay, the support call data flow here, where is it coming from? And this is this little, you know, one plus button right here. Uh, this will give you the answer of like, where is actually the origin of this, right? And that one example, this one example will show you that the actual data is in a blob path and it's in a, in the, actually in the leg somewhere. And you can click on that, right? <clears throat> uh, and expand that. And you can go, uh, go into this particular access. So in order to generate a report, they actually, the origin of the data actually here and you scan it and you do have information about it, right? Um, so what you can do is basically do a switch to the assets and you can get a view for that particular assets in the leg. So this will give you more of an exploded view uh, of all the lineage information, uh, including the original CSV uh, in this particular block uh, with all the properties of that uh, particular CSV uh, and the lineage that we saw. And you could also find the contact information. Let's say you tag the, the, the person who created the data set, you know, the, if the, the owner, expert, um, expert owner, uh, the information could be populated in here. And there's an integration with Azure AD on this. Um, and you can find all the related information if there is anything here, right? So that would be another example or scenario that I want to show for the uh, the business user. Um, you know, first we went through the search experience. Second, we went to the browser experience. Um, now, let's say the the business user um, could be a data scientist. You know, this is a little bit more advanced. Uh, let's say you use um, you use um, Synapse to do some analysis on the data. Um, and you want to find the data set from within Synapse itself. So I'm switching screen right now to look at Synapse Analytics. Uh, there's an example of the workspace here. And uh, to start with, uh, I'm not sure what I'm looking for, right? Um, so, But I know I'm working on some project to do analysis on the order of sales. Um, I mean the sales order. <coughs> uh, so let's go ahead and search for uh, sales order detail, let's say. Um, so if you look at here, uh, before we don't have this little drop down icon called purview. Um, before you go to Synapse, uh, you can search only for the workspace, right? But now you can switch the context. You can switch and say, I want to look for data set in purview. Um, and that's an integration and we're not going to walk through, you know, we're not going to walk through how to set up the integration. There's a documentation on that. But once you integrate Synapse and purview, there's a little drop down icon here and you can search for purview and it's actually an embedded experience within Synapse itself um, with the similar search and browse experience that you saw earlier and it's actually very familiar, right? <coughs> um, so here, um, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the three assets here and I know what I'm looking for. Uh, basically, this sale order detail here. And um, once you click on it, you actually get to see exactly what people see in purview uh, from within Synapse itself. Uh, basically, the overview of the, the access detail, the property of the, the access, uh, the schema, the lineage, if there's any. Uh, so there's a few things going on here. Um, but what you can do is actually um, uh, access the data from Synapse. So if you want to run a query, you can do this. Click develop, uh, get a script, select top 100, and it generate a query for you. Uh, what you do is click run and it's, you know, it's going to give you a uh, you know, select top 100 uh, for this. So, you know, within just a few seconds uh, from, you know, searching, browsing, you actually, you know, going down to the use case of, okay, now I want to use the data. I like it, uh, how to use it. So this answered the question. Okay. Um, so we basically work into the admin experience, the uh, browse and search experience uh, already. Um, so what I'm going to do next is to kind of go back to the Purview Studio here uh, <clears throat> and work, in, uh, work through a few things. Um, <clears throat> so as a data officer or the security officer, um, I want to know a few things um, about uh, our you know, data uh, ecosystems, uh, um, where the data uh, resides, uh, <clears throat> whether I miss anything, whether I need to do something different. Um, that basically a part where insight can answer. You can see right here, it's in preview right now. Uh, this, you know, we're going to lit up um, a bunch of this uh, for GA. Uh, 
uh, later this year and early next year. Um, but for now, um, let me see here. Uh, I think we kind of uh, running out. So there's a timer here that it's only show me a few things. There we go. So the insight um, provides an overview of um, uh, varied pieces within Purview. So um, what the layout and the assets, right? Um, the scan, um, the scan is actually useful for um, the admin to do an audit on their previous scan, um, uh, classery and classification. Those are kind of go together um, in terms of like enriching the data and uh, sensitivity label that, that we talked about earlier with the MIP integration and then file extension. Basically, various file extension reporting, um, uh, including the customization that you have. So let's start with the assets first. As a security officer, I want to come in here and I want to find out like, <clears throat> did we scan everything, right? Or are we missing something or like uh, where the bulk amount of data? And this gives you a view of uh, the asset scan per source type. Um, so in this example, we know that uh, we do have a lot of data in the lake. Uh, in, in the blob storage, uh, some in SAP, you know, very little in the Azure files and possibly SQL, right? Um, <clears throat> and it gives you a view on the um, uh, file extension as well. Uh, to some people, this is kind of useful to know the, you know, the custom file extension showing up here and um, the file does not associate them to any resource set. Actually, I haven't mentioned about this yet, but resource sets is basically a way we group uh, multiple files or folder together if they set up, you know, if they look like they are together um, uh, as a resource. Uh, a good example for that is um, is Parquet folder. So you have a Parquet folder with, you know, let's say a split out by the month and then by the year. Uh, you don't want to scan all of those say, individual files. You want to group them together and call it, you know, one single resource. So that's basically how uh, how resource that works. Um, so this this report here give you a um, a view of you know where the resources are located uh, in various data sources. Uh, next would be the scan. So scan provide the um, this is more useful for the um, uh, for the admin. You know whoever is coming up uh, coming into onboard preview and setting up the environments, uh, they will have a view of all the scans and. Uh, you know, whatever, you know, the number of success and number of failures. And this is, you know, very helpful in terms of do auditing. Um, you know, you want to look at the failed scan uh, and go back and figure out, you know, what needs to be done. Uh, maybe it, be, it could be due to um, authentication. Yeah, so you can fix that and, you know, do a recovery. Um, another item here is the glossary. <clears throat> um, so you can see here how many um, what you know the cow of the assets. So this is uh, this generated by the um, uh, the cow of the assets tab in the in the glossary term. So there's a lot of sale order. And that's why we see the sale order text really big here. Uh, and a term that uh, you know snapshot of the term and then the incomplete term. So um, <clears throat> this gives you a, a you know a place to go and you know figure out what to do next in terms of like you know here's uh, yeah, uh, the term that had a missing steward. So you can go. Uh, back there and do an audit on your class time. Um, um, let me walk to you one example on the classification. So there's, um, yeah, we have out of the box, we have about 105, I believe, and I think grow so uh, quickly. Um, I don't have the exact number anymore, but there's 105 or something out of the box classification. You could customize your classification as well. Uh, this report gives you uh, a reporting uh, for the classified data in the last 30 days for each of the sources. And then there's a, you know, there's a reporting on the classification category. So like PII is, you know, a big, pretty big topic, right? Uh, uh, like how, you know, question from the uh, privacy officer or data uh, security officer is like, yeah, how do I know uh, which, you know, data I have PII? And this report, you kind of give you that kind of view. Uh, you can click more and go to a classification listing uh, with the subscription sources, files, and table. And you could do a search or filter on this. So let's say if we want to know, you know, uh, email address, you know, use this example again, uh, which data source have email addresses? Uh, and you can filter that and look at this. There's 17 table that has email addresses uh, being classified on. And you can click on this 17 um, number 
and get the list of these 17 um, data set. <clears throat> and from there, uh, you can you know take an action item on uh, what to do with this. Yeah, either you know are they supposed to be in here or are they not supposed to be in here? Um, that would be something that the privacy you know team or security team had to work on. Um, so go back in here again. <clears throat> so that would be one useful useful thing about classification. And then you also have like top classification. You can see here there's a lot of you know bank account number in this. So we probably scan a bank and um, you know a bank a sample bank data set here. And then there's also a lot of personal name. <clears throat> uh, next is the sensitivity label. Uh, we didn't scan a lot here in this demo environment, but you know there's some confidential information and some general. And similar to the classification, you can double click on it, you know, and get a list of what the table that have uh, confidential information and do an audit on that. Uh, and this gives you a view of three table here. It has the, the, the label here on the top. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, then you have to decide like whether they're supposed to be in here or are they in the right collection uh, and who should be the person who's responsible for this. So you could even, you know, add the contact here um, in, in the asset itself. <clears throat> and then last, uh, basically the file extension. So file extensions uh, give you a top file extension view uh, that uh, could be useful for a company who do a lot of you know custom type uh, type extension. Uh, we work with all company who uh, who uh, who have uh, data you know who has sens sensor and each of the the the, um, uh, the oil well, and they create a file extension here and they you know they want to have a reporting on that for example, um, <clears throat> and you can do a breakdown by the um, uh, the file count, the subscription where they belong, and the the sources. So. You know, this this uh, insight here is actually quite useful for people who do audits, who get you know regular reportings out of purview. Uh, you could integrate into this as well uh, in the future. So in the future, you could set up Power BI and actually uh, query into purview and get information similar to this, and you could generate your own reporting. So that basically um, uh, the um, the demo that I want to walk through. So we basically went through the scenario of how to onboard purview how to do search and browse, uh, how the Power BI and Synapse integration works, uh, how to actually use Purview within Synapse, right? And then how the security officer and the privacy officer use Purview to do audits, to look at things that they miss, um, and make a corrective action items. So that's a wrap. Thank you so much.